and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. We are back. We are back again. It is your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my bro my brother in arms, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, the man of a thousand runes, and the bane of my fucking existence. Who who is who is who is often rolling dice whether or not Uber Eats is going to screw him this week. <laughs> Good brother Zen, and um, the official entry this week on the on our journey through the level up play tests is the Herald. That is the official name, but for all intents and purposes, it's the Paladin. You know him, the guy with the with the the shield and the one handed weapon, whether it's a sword or a mace or a big fucking hammer, who goes. Thou shalt die! And hits you with all of the divine fury that he can. Yes. The inspiration <laughs> was 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 a idealistic view of the of the crusader. Let's not forget Gygax was a was a Jehovah's Witness, and the knight in shining armor archetype of chivalric romance. Um. So you have the whole you have the whole thing of they they draw on divine powers much like clerics, but they're a bit more. Marshall about it, which um is which will always be kind of amusing because clerics e clerics even with the ba even with the basic setup already had a bit of a martial bent as it was, which is why some grognards argue against the existence of um of cl of paladins that they that they'd be better served as just a as just a reskinned cleric. Obviously, I don't agree with that kind with that kind of notion, and I've. Taken my own spin spins on the on creating a trinity between clerics, paladins, and avengers over the years. Mm -hmm. However, the only uh, thing I think of when I think paladins is the logical extension into Warhammer 40k and the uh, Ordo Malleus. We are the hammer. Uh, now, unfor unfortunately, pal. Um, paladins, much like um, much like bards, although for although for different reasons, have a reputation of being a troublemaker class. Um, large largely because you, largely because uh, you either have a case of that guy wanting wanting to play it, or that DM wanting to wanting to be a dick to whoever's play, whoever is legitimately playing it. Um, Because of the because of the holy knight origins, they were mandated to uphold lawful good lawful good lawful good alignment. Which remember, people around here, the alignment grid is not our friend. Which um even even when I was growing up made no sense because not a, not every god that would have a paladin is going to be a is going to have is going to be a lawful good god. Chaotic good, chaotic good gods would wa would want use of would want use of paladins just as much as any other deity would. Um, and of course, if they failed, they lost most of their special abilities, so they'd at best be a gimped version of a fighter, until they either atoned, or just ch or just did a class change. Um, Blaggard. And alignment. Now alignment restrictions are hard are hardly unique over the years, and we've and um, we've seen plenty of other dumb ones. Hi, barbarian. Um, but because but for whatever reason, paladin because of because of this requirement, paladins tend to bring out the dickishness in certain DMs. No one knows what. No one knows why. Um, on one hand, yeah, the whole, the whole whole the whole knight fallen from grace is a well-worn story angle. Um it do, it does make a handy plot it does make a handy plot hook. But the result there but it's also possible that um that there are some DMs who still hadn't gotten the idea of being competitive out of their out of their heads, name namely um, a good chunk of a good chunk of O D and D DMs that I've that I've had to deal with over the years. Like I said, the um, the O S R crowd and I do not get along. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Well, at best, we'll tolerate each other. 
Oh. I um. I, I I think it's because well, I, I, as uh, you said last time, it all has to do with why they call themselves OSR in the first place. You want to innovate. They want everything to remain how they like it. And if it weren't if it weren't for the fact that I've had that one of my biggest punching get bags over over the last few over the last few decades has insisted on not ch- has insisted on not changing and look at the state that it's in. <laughs> um, maybe I'd be maybe I'd be a little I'd be a little more conducive, but let's face facts. Even if e- it's even if even if you want to do the whole stay the same, eventually people are going to want to branch out. Um, consider the fact that chivalry and sorcery and um, and role master both started out as people being dissatisfied with the lack of compl- with the lack of complexity when it came when it came to certain mechanics in um, the in D and D, and they made those mm-hmm. games as their answer to it yep um in the case of chivalry and sorcery it was it was far more direct in the case of role master it started out as just arms law which was just a collection which was just a collection of house rules that iron that iron crown was doing before they decided to just branch off into their own thing Mm -hmm. now the big the big problem with this whole you have to maintain lawful good is that what's defined as lawful good is right in the hands of your GM. So they, so they could, um, they could, they could do, they could do the whole. Well, I say, I say that this action is lawful good, even though it clearly isn't. So if you don't do it, you're going to lose your powers. The whole fall or die situations, where you you either you either adhere to your you either adhere to your alignment and end up dead or you decide to go against it fall and have and have, and have to become a black guard and honestly um that's a hallmark of a bad dm it's just another form of railroading now because of because of that you inevitably had the opposite happen where you had some paladins who over who overplayed their law lo- their lawful goodness out of fear that if they did that if they didn't act like if they didn't like like uh, like a fucking idiot, then the DM would de- would declare them not being lawful good. Or the very rare instance of a player who honestly thinks that lawful good acts this way. Yeah. Um. Now, with some with things like the with. Things like the rogue as a kleptomaniac, or the chaotic, or the chaotic neutral p- um, pissing on people—that's just people using the fluff to be an asshole. Whereas the paladin had, mechanically speaking, had to be an asshole. And uh-huh. because of how mimetic culture goes, as time went on, that that what became a slight problem ended up getting exacerbated through me- through memes over the years. Thus, thus, how that reputation ended up happening. This is this is the reason why I say that it's um, it's si- there's some similarity in the fact that they're treated like a problem class, like the bar- like the bard can be, but the route that they end up getting to that problem class is different. Yes. Now. In four in fourth edition, the uh, well, we'll get we'll get to that. But it did, but I think it's I think it's very telling that it took that it took like twenty years for um for was for either T- TSR never tried to address the problem, and it took like tw- and it wasn't until fourth edition that this problem was attempted to be addressed with um, fourth edition. <laughs> and. To, and to be fair, there, to be fair, um, for when, it, for the longest time, playing paladin wasn't wasn't seen, wasn't um, in high regard until more recent years. So, um, it really, I, I would say it really depended on the group. I saw a lot of groups in three point five where paladins weren't treated with disdain. 
probably because you didn't have probably because you didn't have people um doing the alignment bullshit as much. Not as much, but uh there were a couple people who tried to pull the lawful stupid. DMs uh quickly abused them and disillusioned them. Didn't abuse them on purpose. Like they weren't saying, "Oh, that guy's being lawful stupid." Better better make an example of them. It was more Lawful stupidity in this scene led to very poor results on a consistent basis. Um, the lawful stupids quickly understood that maybe being so slavishly devoted to the rules in such a way that you act like a complete dumbass was not the best idea. Especially since something um, I've tried to encourage as a DM, and some of my friends have, is let's say you have a character whose intelligence is 14. Now, according to many of the attribute uh, places, or attribute descriptions in, in D&D, average is 10. Average intelligence is 10. If you're at 14, you're actually rather smart. So if you're a, a paladin with 14 intelligence, you're going to be smart enough to be tactful. You're going to be smart enough to follow your code without without being so overt and obnoxious that you pull trouble onto yourself. And so sometimes, uh, just as a, a nudge, I'll know the intelligence of a paladin, or, or the DM will, and the paladin, the, st the lawful stupid paladin will try to play a lawful stupid play, and the DM will go, are you sure about that? Are there any alternatives? I mean, you're not really playing to your strengths here. And after they've, you know, been disillusioned and, and a bit abused by the fact that they were playing Lawful Stupid, they started to understand that their paladin as a character has both a mechanical reason and a narrative reason not to be a complete and uh, complete tactless oaf. Now, the earliest version of Paladins was in, was in the companion set for Beck Me era D&D, um, &D, mm -hmm. which was a, a, proto, a prototype idea of a prestige class. Um, it was a fighter with lawful alignment that reached, that reached ninth level, could, instead of becoming a lord's, um, swear fealty to a, large, to a lawful church to be inducted into their order which could give them certain abilities as if they were a cleric of a lower level. Namely, ca namely um, cleric magic, turning undead, detect evil, um, but they had to obey their churchly superiors unless commanded to, to do evil, and they must offer what assistance they can to non-evil people in need of help, unless already on a mission for a higher authority. Um, this... Um, the companion set also introduced the Avenger, which is the chaotic <clears throat> counterpart to the Paladin, mm -hmm. and basically an attempt to make the Black Guard before the Black Guard. Um, it showed up again in AD and D first as as lawful good. And this is, I'd say, this is where we started to get where we started to get the um, first inklings of that little problem. Yeah. Um. Now, Unearthed Arcana, which had its own, with the original Unearthed Arcana, um, allowed people to play as the as Paladin ca Paladin Cavaliers, which were broken as hell. Um, like they could stay Can't. they could stay conscious and retreat at negative hit points. Could boost strength, Constitution, Dexterity, and Charisma a little bit at each level up, and immunity to fear. Can't imagine why that'd be OP. Not at all. <laughs> um, Cav Cavaliers Cavaliers have been around ever since, but they've never been, but they've never been given the full treatment. I think they they've been they've been they were themes in fourth edition. I think they were a prestige class in a splat book in third, but I can't imagine why they ne why they never got full why they never got full um, treatment. It's just TSR and WotC being short-sighted. Not at all the balancing issues. Not at all. Yeah. 
Um, now, in AD&D 2nd Edition, they were a warrior subclass. Subclass in, was basically a... It, you, sub, um, warrior, was, warrior was more of the archetype, kind of like the four crystals in the FF Legend project we're working on. Yeah. <clears throat> um... The main thing that they were noted for was the ability was the poss possibility of using Holy Avenger magic weapons, which did plus ten damage versus chaotic evil foes, which is a lot at the time, and mm -hmm. create a um, selective anti magic field versus lower level magical effects. Um, their kits had had some brand of no notoriety. Once again, the Cavalier again. <laughs> Which, oh, Lordy, coming! Yep. Um, which is actually where actually where the third edition paladin got its fear immunity um thing from. Um, and of course, there's the Inquisitor. If you want to, if you want to make the GM cry when all his mages die, <laughs> especially given that they that that they can ha that they can have a lot of um dispel magic spells at their disposal. Which prob which probably which probably did not make Monty Cook happy. Uh -huh. Um. But a, but if they but the thing with them is that if they, they're supposed to find their their holy sword, and if they can't, then they're just a slightly weaker version of a fighter. So um. they have to find the holy sword first. Mm hmm. Hmm. Seems fair. Um. Unless, of course, we've got too many ladies and too many lakes throwing out swords to make too many people king. <laughs> Let's see. Because um... I certainly didn't vote for him. <laughs> Third edition, we have we have we have the p we have the peak of the problem class um, issues. They do. They um. They did have. They. This is where we also got our first inkling of of smite evil as well as as well as the paladin's mount um smite evil i understood why that was added in um the paladin's mount always stru always struck me as odd i know it's um, trying to go i know it's trying to go with the whole holy knight thing but i never i never um i never saw the point of it being bi of it being baked in in this regard i am um, i think it's just because they wanted to give you something even more tangible to take away from you than just your powers. Because remember, in third edition, if you break your oath, you also lose access to your to your uh, your your steed. Because you lose access to all paladin class features, and the steed is one of them. <clears throat> and Lovely. I don't know. I don't know if that was intentional. I have a feeling it was because you're you're. Your steed could act as a witness for you um, in the event that it saw a crime, it could report it to you, essentially. Since, you know, you're a paladin. So, if, if you commit a crime, your steed is like, no, 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 and goes away. I legitimately think it's just so if you fucked up, you had a material thing to take away from them. Yeah, it's I um, that still that still veers way too much in the pay to not suck category. Paladin prior to fourth is the pay to not suck calor category. That's that's certainly the, that's certainly the case. Um, especially espe now, there were some. There, now some of the splat books pr put in put in some prestige classes that could that could certainly help mix things up a little bit. Um, chiefly among them, complete div complete divine allowed for you to make a chaotic good version of a paladin through the holy liberator prestige. Um, and a sp and a and a spellless paladin was in um, complete warrior, but. Overall, third edition paladins were fourth tier. Good at destroying kind of... evil. Good at destroying evil creatures. Okay at diplomacy and not much else. Also, mm. they have they have mad problems because 
You need strength and constitution for combat and wisdom and charisma for spellcasting. Yep. I um I also remember that in three point five, uh there was another splat book, I believe, that introduced four paladin archetypes. The paladin of tyranny, the paladin of freedom, the paladin of of, of uh Oh, what was it? Corruption, I think it was. I don't remember. It was it was one for each of the of the corners of the grid. Mm -hmm. It was not very good. <laughs> um, Just felt obligated to bring it up. <laughs> now, there was a holy there was a holy or unholy night prestige class in D twenty modern. Um. But the but one of the requirements was a base attack bonus of eight, and with a lot of the, with a lot of the not many not many of the um, D twenty modern classes had full BAB. That but, could lead to an issue. But it has the main paladin abilities in five levels. Um, But it and it's given the fact that it had divine that it starts off with divine grace, it's it's good it's it was good for dipping. <laughs> With um, since you could since you could use that to make a te a telepath build for at a pre at a pretty decent setup. Um, Pathfinder is I'd say is I'd say is one of the first instances of the paladin starting to not suck. Um, first off, they have they have it that instead instead of needing both wisdom and charisma, you just need charisma for your spell casting, um, which got carried forward in D and D as well. Mm -hmm. um, this also this also means that wisdom is is essentially your can be your um, can be your dump stat. Um, um, smites on top of granting their. Bo bo um, boosts keep smiting until they either smite something else or the target is dead. Sure, it, it can in theory it can run out in 24 hours, but nothing suffering from a smite is going to live that long. Um, they did dial back. The... Go ahead. I was going to say Dave's Volt, motherfucker. <laughs> um, the code of the code of con the code of conduct was dialed back a little bit so that paladins could actually. Not be the um, stick in the mud. Um, the big pro the big problem though, the palad once ag once again this is a this is a problem that I've had with um, rangers and other classes too specialized. Like it's really really good if you've got outright evil aligned um, monsters getting thrown at the party. Otherwise, there's problems. Um, name. Namely, it's it's very specialized towards things like outsiders and un and undead and the like. Mm -hmm. Um. But what? But um. But when you're not when you're not dealing with those when you're not dealing with those kind of setups, um, then there's problems. And fortunately, the fortunately the um. Side, the side grades when it comes to class setups, i.e., I. Um, the i.e. Pathfinder's version of kits, um, does does allow does allow for a lot of abilities that can be trade that can be traded to do other setups. Um, archetypes is the word I'm thinking of, and the only class that has more archetypes is the monk. Some of them are simple, like divine hunter, so you can so you can do all your paladin shit at range. Um, to sac to sacred ser to sacred servant, eh, <laughs> where you get a you get a plater ally and more casting, which, if done properly, boot puts them right up at tier two. Or if they want to be, it's a big if though. Yeah. Um. Now, Pathfinder se Pathfinder Second Edition drastically changed it. Um, call it, calling the paladin the champion, mm -hmm. and allowing for any good, any good, any good alignment, and later on, um, 
any evil alignment in the advanced players guide. Um, you just couldn't be neutral if you were going to be some sort of champion. Mm -hmm. Their, sp in their spell casting got condensed into focus casting, so you have sp you have spells that so the whole spell subtype of spells that use points instead instead of um, instead of Vantian. Yeah. Which, um, is one of is one of those th is one of those things that al that always rubs me the wrong way with um, Pathfinder Second Edition. Not only do they keep the Vantian model, but they now have Vantian and spell and spell points in several classes. Including which is, a good chunk of the casters, which is dumb. Like you have, you have cert focus casting. You have spell. <laughs> you use spell points for these specific small set of spells, and for everything else, you use Vancian. Um, which is, as I just said, dumb. Mm-hmm. Now. Smite was replaced with a counterattack based on alignment. Either a counterattack while protecting an ally, forcing the enemy to choose between dealing no damage or dealing less less damage and being we and being weakened, and so and so on. Um. Bas basically, trying to do their own spin on say Final Fantasy Cover. <clears throat> um, you do get a divine bond, but. Instead, instead of instead of making it a um, instead of making it a steed, you could just as easily make it a sword or a shield. Um, I do think I do think that the second edition palette, Pathfinder second edition paladin isn't terrible, but d d despite the despite them wanting it to be called champion, I'm sorry, I'm calling a spade a fucking spade. Huh. Um, At least they were able to do something different with it. Yeah. Um, in four in four E. Um. This is wh in four E D and D. This is where we started to really lighten up, attempt to lighten up on the whole alignment restrictions thing. You just had to be the same alignment as your deity. Um. Um. Deviating from one's alignment doesn't result in losing class features. You might get you might get threats that the other faithful will try and seek you out and chastise you. But, appar but apparently Paladins Must Be Lawful Good had become such a sacred cow that people were bitching over its loss, even as they bemoaned lawful stupid Paladins. Um. And because... Um, because... Although this did As... this did end up resulting in the running gag of, um, pa of fourth edition's Paladins taking no fall damage. <laughs> Now, as much as I hate this statement when it was said, um, in response to the whole bitching about losing lawful good only while bi while also bitching simultaneously about lose uh, about the lawful stupid, um, you think you know what you want, but you don't. I hate the statement from from the context when it was actually said because no. Video gamers very much did know what we want, and it certainly wasn't what you were showing, asshole. But, in this particular singular instance, it's true. You think you know what you want, but you don't. <sighs> this, this is the reason why I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I never work at Wizards of the Coast. Because there are far too many people to answer to <clears throat> regarding any idea. Yeah, and it's also the it's also the reason why I don't like worshiping on the at the altar of tradition. Um. Now, I did the math. Paladins in four E had the highest amount of healing surges compared to any other class. Um, that makes sense actually especially since some of their powers required expending healing surges e exactly mm -hmm. <coughs> but they were they were purely a they were purely a t 
they were the, they were a ta they were the tanky boys. If you wanted the more I smite the kind of paladin, that's what the Avenger is for. Yeah. Now the now the five e pal the five e paladin. Um. There's a few minor differences from the third edition days. First off, detect evil is um is charisma is charisma based and can't be used on the same turn as a smite because move actions don't don't exist. Um. Now in, instead of detecting alignment, you can detect you just detect celestials, fiends, and undead. Um. Bit a bit specific for my taste, but okay. As well as if areas have been consecrated or desecrated. Um, so, mu so mundane, e so mundane evil can still surprise them. Yep. And You'll be able to tell if somebody's made this place unholy or holy, but you won't be able to tell that that guy coming along the road is about to stab you in the kidney. Yep. They have different types of smite spells as they as they level up with additional effects. Lay on hands is a reservoir of hit points per day that expands with each level, um, instead of a instead of a fixed value for a fixed number of times per day. And honestly, I I prefer the latter than the former. <laughs> I find lay on hands to only be useful for two things if you're playing a paladin in five e. <clears throat> Dispelling a, a status of some sort because it, it, uh, I believe there's a fixed amount of points you can use from your pool to get rid of like a poison, and then uh, healing yourself in the event that you're dangerously close to uh, to unconsciousness and thus death. Really, the only reasons to use it because it's range range of touch. Unfortunately. Um, much, much like the, much like one of the other half casters, that being the Rangers, um, Paladins had a bit of a dead level problem, where there are certain levels where they get nothing but hit points, proficiency, and a spell slot, and um, that re and a resource pool that only recovers on long rests. And we've talked ab we've talked about how much we hate um we hate lo we hate the whole short rest long rest setup. Yeah, but I wouldn't count those as dead levels per se. Paladins really in fifth really only have one purpose: get out their tank hits and hit real hard. Um, they're your they're your your mighty glaciers. Um, and as such, most of your paladin spells you, you, you're never going to use because you're just going to burn a spell to get another smite because you could do that. It makes me, it makes me wonder why casting for them was e was even considered. Oh right, probably. Oh yeah, I was about to say holdover. And also, you know, maybe there's someone trying to play a paladin that's more than just somebody on the front lines. A uh, dude. No. The only spells you should be taking are some some minor buff spells that maybe you'll use, but more more than likely you'll just burn them. For another smite, because mm -hmm. smite is ooh, tasty, tasty damage early on. Yeah. Although, although at 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 the very um, at the very least, they didn't. Um, paladin paladins do have do have the problem of being a jack of many trades in a in a room full of specialists. But mm -hmm. I'd say that they don't have the problem nearly as badly as the ranger does. Oh. That's true. That's true. I can I can see that. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that, I think we get to our level up five E version, the Herald. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why why the why the um, name why the name change was done. Um, because the idea now is that they're even, they're somewhat evangelical. Uh, in the very first uh, couple, or in the very first couple passages, dedicated and resolute, heralds are messengers of the oaths, ideology, or faith they represent, 
seen by some as salvation, others as harbingers of doom. The powers that they wield appear to stem from their devotions, though whether the Herald interprets it as such is up to the individual. All are magically trained combatants who often serve a particular organization formed upon an ideology. Some may have taken up the role simply as a vocation, while others became heralds due to a personal calling. Though they often specialize in combat, most understand a calm or threatening voice may be much more effective, especially for the cause of spreading the ideologies they live by. So they are literally heralds for their, their cause. At least, that's the theme mm -hmm. for them. <laughs> yeah. Now, the first, th the f the first thing, the first thing to note is that spe is inst originally spell you didn't get spell casting until second level. Here, you get spell casting right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. But um, and of and of course, of course, the first three things that you're gonna get are spell casting with um two first level spells and two cantrips. Um, and you also get. Go ahead. I was gonna say you also get divine sense and lay in hands. Yeah, divine sense more or less more or less works the same the same way as it did before. And lay on hands works the same way. I um, I feel like I feel like it would be e I f the reason why I say I'd prefer a I prefer a set of charges that did a preset amount instead of um instead of a pool like this is I feel it would be much easier to track. Um. And because and because of that, instead of doing the whole you expend five hit points from the pool, you could just do. You use one. You use one charge. Yeah. Um. Now for now, um. And at second level, we they instead of instead of instead of fight instead of um. Instead of fighting style, you have you have combat maneuvers. Which we've t which we've um dis we've discussed in the past on h on how that particular thing works. Um, yeah. It also looks like they don't have any new maneuver uh, new maneuver um, disciplines. Looks like it's three disciplines that have been or traditions, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, that have been discussed in previous uh, level of five E uh, discussions we've had, and that's uh, the sanguine knot, spirited steed, or tempered iron. Um, and you have you have to choose you have to choose between two of them in order to, and those are the ones you're proficient in. Um, yeah. I do li I do like that you can expend spell slots to gain exer to gain exertion points. Um, two for two for a first um first level spell slot and two and two more for each spell slot above first. Um, of course, you also get um, you also get smite. So whenever whenever you when it, and it looks like an, instead of let me ch let me check um let me check how smite worked in vanilla. I'm pretty sure in five e vanilla it was radiant damage as well. It was radiant damage, but you had to expend a spell slot. In this case, you just do it. You just take a bonus action. And the and the um. And the extra da the extra damage um, goes up, goes up with your level. I actually like I think I like that better. Um, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, you expend one spell slot to deal radiant damage in addition to the weapon's damage. Mm -hmm. Um. But the damage was based on the level of the spell slot, so 2d8 for a first level, 1d8 per each level higher than first, up to a maximum of 5d8. Yeah, in, the, in this case, it's 1d8 one, one at second through fourth level, 2d8 at fifth through um, fifth through eighth, and 3d8 at ninth, ninth and 10th. Um, 
And I'm guessing it would probably follow that pattern all the way up. Mm -hmm. But it it does on on it does ult, it does ultimately mean that um that sm smiting it, I'd say a, I'd say a lot of the th a lot of the things that people would do would go nova with when it comes to smiting have been have been moved over to maneuvers. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Especially given how, especially given the relationship between spell slots and exertion points. Mm -hmm. Um. Now I can I can see some people saying that what what's stopping them from just keep from just keeping smiting every, every turn? It's like, well now now you have a reason to do so without having to worry that you're going to burn out. Act, although actually I take that I take that back because. You can only use smiting a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and, and you only regain the spent uses on a long rest, which mm -hmm. is stupid. So that means that means you could only smite once per lo once per long rest at at second level. Oh. That would be twice. So your proficiency bonus plus two from levels one through five, I think it was. Um. Which, which is where assuming we're... assuming we're using base uh, fifth proficiency proficiency bonus for this. Although I do have shock have... points on the fact that the proficiency bonus isn't on the class chart, like it's supposed to be. I know. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see, then at third level we have archetype. Um, we can't do we can't do the subclass hour this time, but let's not and say we did. Um, <laughs> then we. We, it brings up the whole thing with archetype spells and um, and ch and channel divinity, um, and of and of, co of course, channel, once you channel divinity, you can't do so again until until a short or long rest. Boo. Um, uh, you know what? You know how I'm channeling my divinity right now, monk. How? Churros. <laughs> Um, and these churros were served with honey. There's a honey dipping cup with them. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Then, then there's exploration next, which we will cover later. For like we've like we've done in the past. Um, let's see. Then, imp then empowered smite. So whenever you use smite, you can p you can pick a additional effect. Um, or you can, or you can start empowering smites by expending spell slots. Well, no, you you uh, you either can't use the feature again; it's once per long rest, or you empower the smite again, mm -hmm. getting a spell slot, a first level or higher. Yeah. And so we have we have igniting smite. So, which deals fire damage, and the target must make a con save at the start of each turn, or take or take one d six um, fire damage. As you catch them on fire. Mm -hmm. Let's see, marking smite. They shed bright light for five feet and dim light for an additional five. It lasts up to one minute, but they gain no effect. They gain no benefit from invisibility and have disadvantage on checks made to hide or repelling smite. You instead deal force damage, and they have to make a strength save, or be pushed back ten feet and knocked prone. Or on a mm. save, they're only knocked back five feet and knock knocked prone. I'd say between the three of these, um, the one that the one that would probably get a lower grade is marking smite, simply because simply because hiding and distant and. Monsters that are going to try and hide and use invisibility are a bit more specific than some of the other ones. Yeah. Um. I kind of I kind of wish that there I kind of wish that there were smites for other types of elemental damage. Um. Or just uh, just other just in instead of instead of ignite instead of igniting instead of igniting smite just uh, just have it that there's multiple types that do different types of um non-physical damage mm -hmm. because what purpose would what purpose would serve if your if your god is if you're serving say cord in using fire damage 
<laughs> cord's the cord's the lord cord is the and is the um is D and D's equivalent to Thor. Yep. Like if he's get if if he's gonna be using igniting and I I it is po it is possible that that um that it might, that the second effect might be a bit trickier, but it's been done. So I'm so I'm not giving I'm not giving a pass. Um, mm -hmm. repelling smite I can see that being used for um bull for what I call bully builds. <laughs> um, anybody who does anybody who would pick repelling smite is probably the person who abuses bull rush a lot. And this is the bull rush, or they like to uh, constantly throw people into walls for extra damage. Yeah, um, guilty. <laughs> um, especially, especially since at one po at one point, um, I had managed to f I had managed to find ten rings of ram. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> ten. Yeah, rings I. Go ahead. I, I I'd say some. I, I would say that they don't stack. I'd just be like, okay, so you're wearing ten rings of ram. You still only get the the. Uh, you still only get the effect once. <laughs> This guy forget. This guy forgot that I that I knew how to do. I knew how to exploit this kind of thing. Especially, yeah. Especially since I was I um I had multiclassed into monk, so I had flurry of blows. That's just mean. <laughs> I mean, I will I will fully admit that I took advantage of a new D and D to to a D and D two. Uh. To the po to the point that he didn't know you don't have to uh, award XP for wish spells that kill things. Because mm -hmm. a ring of three wishes with two wishes on it is enough wishes to give yourself a twenty five digit long uh, amount of XP when you're only level four. Yeah, <laughs> I, w I was I was a dick too. I'll admit, but. <laughs> What you did was just kind of mean. <laughs> I um, I want I will fr I will freely admit I wanted to go I wanted to go full Muda with this. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> anyway, and, if, and, it, and of course there there would be no Oda in the way, so uh, whatever you touched with that would have exploded into tiny bits. Yeah. Roses are red, violets are blue. Omaiwa mo shinderu. Nani? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, ability score improvements. No need we all know what ASI improvement. is. Yep. Same thing with extra attack. Um, Her heraldic sermon. Yep. Then we have... Shouldn't that be... Go ahead. Looks like uh, choices. We have choices. Once again, we once again the rule of three applies. So we either have devout, event, evangelism, or fearmonger. So devout, you gain proficiency in persuasion. You have advantage when using the skill to influence uh, to influence others by discussing your oath or um, deity, and witnesses who hear your words are inspired to share any useful or important information they may have. Evangelism. You gain proficiency in performance. You have advantage when using the skill to convert others through preaching about your oath or deity and witnesses that hear your words are inspired to donate to your cause. Um, Fearmonger. You have proficiency in intimidation. You have advantage when using the skill, to, the skill and your faith to intimidate others and witnesses with opposing views make obvious efforts to avoid you. Um, the last sentence in all three... First off... For all intents and purposes, this is the same setup three times. It's the same setup three times. It's just three different skills, three different final effects on witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, however, I give them an F for effort. Because of, because, the, because of the fact that it's so copy-pasted? That, <clears throat> and the fact that while you tried to put a narrative hook in there by saying witnesses do something in response to what you are doing, it, it isn't like the, again, like we discussed, especially with Warlock last week, mm -hmm. 
the personality is missing again. Like, oh yeah, I'm evangelizing. I'm all of you people out here, lend me your ear so I can tell you about the greatness of the great God Cord. He does lightning shit, guys. Come on. Mm-hmm. What's got cool about lightning? Join me. Join lightning today. You know, and then they're all like, oh yeah, yeah, here's some money for that. That's great. Yeah. I just kind of. I feel. Re- like, I feel like. I'm... Um. I feel like some something like that. First off, this is what this is why I've um looking looking at games like this, I've gradually begun to realize how spoiled I was by the extensive downtime system that um, FC has. Mm-hmm. Because. I guarantee if you're using the if you're using Crafty's setup, there would be there would be a full thing about what's about what sort of treasure table you might roll on or what or how much how much money you'd end up get you'd end up getting that would have to be factored into your panache and prudence, obviously. Um or when when it comes to when it comes when it comes to th- when it comes to things like things like witnesses, um something a little bit more than these would pr- these would probably get a higher grade if there was more than just half a sentence about witnesses for each of these. If, like when I first saw witnesses hear your words and are inspired to share any useful or important information they might have, I thought, huh, maybe each of these will have something really cool like that. And then it's just copy paste stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, uh. Yeah. Uh, it hurts my heart. Yeah. Um, or at the at the very at the very least, uh, like like say a se- a sentence that describe that describes each of these because they uh, because um this is a so this is a social ability. Yeah, but it's not a very it's not a very good one. Mm-hmm. <sighs> At si- at sixth level, you gain sacred aura, not to be confused with sacred ointment, and not to be confused with Genshiku. <laughs> any any of you who uh, are truly man the manliest of men and manliest of women will understand exactly where that came from. Yep, especially with Super Robot Wars Thirty on the horizon, following the Hakayo story. Mm-hmm. So, with so with sacred aura at sixth level, you're able to manifest an aura that aids you and your allies, has a radius of fifteen feet, centered on you, and you must be conscious for you and your allies to benefit from it. You can only have one of the following auras active at any time, but can change it during it during a long rest. At eighteenth level, the range is increased to thirty feet. So you. Well, have, it's talking about a level beyond ten for once in a one of the non-original class documents. Mm-hmm. So, or of courage, cannot be frightened, or of resistance, uh, whenever you or an ally within range makes a saving throw, they gain a bonus equal to your charisma modifier, and or of willpower, you cannot you cannot be charmed. Um, I... The aura, th- the aura thing do- is very, is very much a ca- is very much a carryover from, um, from Pathfinder. <laughs> um, there are a lot, there are a lot more, there was a lot more focus on auras in Pathfinder. And still, none of them as good as the Genesis aura. Yeah, but at, but at the same t- at the same time, um, I feel I feel like these particular auras are undercooked. I I feel like, like one of them is less cooked than the other two. Or like they do, like they they don't they don't contribute at, they don't contribute as much but in comparison to what it's supposed to be. Especially considering their sixth level. Yeah. I'd say I'd say when it when it comes to these um the only the only one that gets a passing grade and even that's not by much is aura of resistance. And it's only because it's scalable, right? <clears throat> it's only because it's scalable, and it's, o- and it's only because of the fact that it's do- that it's you're at, you're at least ha- you're at least having an effect on your on your allies instead instead of just a glorified passive. 
Yeah. I just feel it's all... I don't know, there's... Uh, uh, bleh. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, then we have Greater Empowered Smite. At 8th level, you learn the, fo you learn the following empower empow new empowerments to your smites. You can use this feature twice at no cost in between long rests. And alternatively, you can, u you can use an Empowered s Smite by expending a spell slot of 1st level or higher. So we have... Blinding Smite, Disorienting Smite, and Taunting Smite. Um, blinding Smite, they make, a, they make a con save. On a failure, they're blinded for one minute. At each of its turns, they can repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on success. Disorienting, your Smite instead deals sm psychic damage, and the target makes a Wisdom save. On a failed save, it has a disadvantage on attack rolls for a minute. Now, at, the, at the end of each of its turns, it can repeat the saving throw. Um... Taunting Smite, the target makes a wisdom makes a wisdom save on a fa on a failed save. It takes an additional one d six radiant damage when attacking a creature other than you, and cannot make attacks of opportunity against anyone but you for up to one minute. We're um, starting to see mad again with this. Yeah, <clears throat> I. Well, I, actually, no, I. I Hold on, I'm a uh, no, no, it's I'm it's wrong. not quite I'm wrong. Right because for the for these saving throws, your um your stat your your spell save DC is still based on charisma. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm wrong. I was about to say that. <laughs> but even if it, if it were a contested roll, that would be yeah. mad for sure. But um, even with that, for for um for these are the same. Level... It's the same thing as as above. Copy pastes, lots of copy pastes. Yeah, and. This isn't it. Uh, these don't feel all that greater. In my opinion, in my opinion, they feel they feel like they should be in the same list as the empowered smites from previously. I. I yeah yeah they feel the same the same level. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've been doing a little bit of of looking ahead ish, and I'm. I'm almost wondering if I'm going to rage at this more than I did Warlock. Yeah. So, at ninth level, we have Inspiring Devotion, and once again, we have once again we have a cho a choice of three. So we and it is a, a social situation <laughs> is literally mentioned in the actual description. Yeah. So first we have Lend Faith. When an ally within thirty feet can see or hear you would make a saving throw or ability check, you can inspire them with your faith, adding your charisma modifier to the roll. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short rest. Boo. Um, reveal heresy. You gain proficiency in insight and add double your proficiency bonus to in to insight checks. What's the purpose of... What's the pur I thought you were putting in expertise die for this kind of situation. What the hell? Um... Whenever a creature is lying to you, it makes a charisma save against a DC equal to your passive insight. The save is made with disadvantage and done in secret by the narrator. On a failure, you get a strong sense that they're being untruthful. Um, and truth of and truth of conviction. Whenever you or an ally are telling the truth and make any charisma ability check to do so, you can use this feature to treat any roll or of ten or less as an eleven for that roll. Once you've used this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short rest. Um, These are all crap. I'd say the only, I'd say the one that's the least crap, simply because it doesn't have the short rest um, catch, is reveal heresy. And even then, it even then that has problems. The big, the it's big, cra it's crap. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the big issue with the, the big issue is that you either have way too much, way too much limitation for something you're getting at ninth level. Or you, or you have something that isn't um, that is just adding numbers and giving you a truth sense of mm -hmm. sorts. Just cast zone of truth for fuck's sake. You'd probably you'd probably be able to. G Actually, let me ch let me check on let me check on that. Well, I, I mean, we don't know we don't know the actual spell uh, spell zone or spell books that a herald would get, but I'm pretty sure paladins were had access to zone of truth. Yeah, let me see. Let me take a look. Paladin, Paladin spells. 
Let me just lo let me just load up this list, which is going to take a second. So, yep, second second level pa second level paladin spell on their list. Yep, bard cleric and paladin all get access to it. Mm-hmm. And th and that's gonna ha and that's gonna last te that's gonna last ten minutes. For those who are unfamiliar with Zone of Truth, it's a second level spell. Takes one casting ca uh, an action ca uh, casting time of one action. Range of sixty feet. Components are vocal and somatic. Duration ten minutes. You create a magical zone that guards against deception in a fifteen foot radius sphere centered on a point of your choice within range. Until the spell ends, a creature that enters the spell area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there must make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, a creature can't speak a deliberate lie while in the radius. You know whether each creature succeeds or fails on its saving throw. An affected creature is aware of the spell and can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as it remains within the, the boundaries of the truth. So... What Reveal Heresy is, is a weaker version of Zone of Truth. Mm -hmm. One, it only happens when something lies to you, so it's a reaction. Two, uh, you don't know that the, whether they're affected or not until they fail. Um, and if they don't fail, you won't get the sense that they're being untruthful. A good DM would cover this up by saying... Your sense says they might be untruthful, which isn't a strong sense that they're being untruthful. It's just they might be. But Zone of Truth is outright just, I'm going to use a level two spell to make it so you can't lie to me if you fail the charisma saving throw. And in this case, this charisma save, this would be against, directly against your spell save DC, which is going to be at... Very much likely better than your insight, your passive insight score. Very much likely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Reveal Heresy is just a shittier version of Zone of Truth. Um, and then Truth of Conviction and Lend Faith are just meh. Yeah. Lend Faith is, I can help you. It, it's, it's, it's the helping action, specifically adding your charisma modifier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Truth of Conviction is, oh, uh, anything 10 or less is an 11, which can be good in some situations, sure, but it's only on charisma ability checks, and it's only when you're telling the truth. It's literally so limited, such a small fraction of what you'll do, that you will likely only use it once mm -hmm. in a full campaign. It's dumb. Where's, where's, like, why isn't Lend Faith something like you're, you're, you're lending faith to one of your friends who, who might be under the effect of some sort of geis or curse, or someone is trying to geis or curse them who is, whose ideology is somehow opposed to yours. And by lending faith, you can help them overcome, uh, not just by adding numbers, but you know, maybe it's a, a consistent thing. They're trying, someone's trying to curse them, while at the same time you're lending faith, and everybody's making these active roles for resistances and additions and everything else. Mm -hmm. There's so much that could have been done with this. Yeah, but we'll get, we'll, we'll likely get to that um, shortly. I am. <sighs> um. See then is improved sacred aura. At tenth at tenth level, you gain a more powerful aura that is active alongside your sacred aura. The range is the same, and you can only have one improved sacred aura active at a t at a time. You can swap your active improved aura upon finishing a long rest. Um, when it comes to these, it, when it comes to these um things like smiting and improved smiting, am I the one who feel who feels that this kind of thing should have been unified? Mm -hmm. Because 
in this ki in this particular case, there's the implication that you're stacking auras. You are. And because because of because of that, I'm of the I'm of the mindset that a that a a better a better approach is to just have a unified list of auras and at tenth level go. Okay, okay, that okay. You can pick when you when you decide to activate an aura, you can pick two that you know and use them both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It would cer it would certainly save some space. Um, save some space and also you know not be confusing as shit. Yeah. But you have aura of healing, aura of overcoming, and aura of smiting. Aura of healing whenever you or an ally cast a spell to heal yourself or or another ally while both are within your aura. Both the spellcaster and the target gain additional hit points equal to your charisma. Um, it's not. Ex I feel that's some. Um, even considering you're your, considering you get this at tenth level, and even if you roll a perfect eighteen on charisma, and, and you actually spend ASI to get charisma up to the maximum of twenty, if they're still following. 5e um, maximums. They That's are. only a plus 5 con mod. Or, I mean, yeah. uh, charisma mod. It's only a plus 5. Okay, I'm gonna heal this guy over here. At 10th level, you should be throwing heals around for uh, an average of 17 to 20 HP. Mm -hmm. So, sure. That's a nice chunk for the person you're healing. Uh, you've, you've now gone from 70 to 20 to an average of 22 to 25. But... For the spellcaster, I get five HP. Whoa! Yeah, and by by the time by the time you reach the teens, getting five extra HP is not worth shit. Now the real question is, what if you do this using lay on hands on yourself? Do you get the plus five to yourself twice because you're both the caster and the recipient? I'm get. I'm guessing that lay on hands would. I'm guessing that their argument would be that lay on hands wouldn't count because it has to be a spell. Okay, so let's then say cure minor wounds. Since you're casting cure minor wounds on yourself, do you get plus five twice? Assuming you're using, you know, you've got charisma to twenty and thus have the plus five charisma mod. Um, do you still get? <laughs> Plus five twice since you're both a spellcaster and recipient. My lack of foresight senses are tingling. I know. That's why I'm asking this question. This is a lack of future proofing. Also a lack of idiot proofing. Mm -hmm. Um I'm ass I'm assuming that the, that there's gonna be an errata that if you're cast if you're casting healing on your on yourself. That. You only get plus five. You only get the charisma mod once. Yeah. Because I'm gonna laugh if the errata says that says the opposite. If you are casting on yourself, you get the charisma mod twice. Um, if that <laughs> if that ends up if that ends up happening, then well, for one, I will eat crow over that. Um, two. Well, I just I I don't uh, I. Uh. Two. There's so much monk, so much. Yeah. Why? Um, but the other, the other thing, the other thing is that, is that it can, is that the, I get the, in, I get the intent that you're, that you're, that you're supposed, that a paladin is supposed to be a team player with, with how everything is set up in this. Yeah. But on, but on the other, on the other hand, it's, um. It isn't do it isn't doing a very good job of of fall of um following through on that because if you if you could get ten then what's stopping you from spending most from spending those healing spells on yourself in that case? Because ten HP at, at tenth level is still a pretty nice chunk to put on top of whatever other healing you're doing. Yeah. Um. Aura of overcoming weapon attacks are considered magical for the purposes of overcoming damage resistances and immunity. Lame. It's basic. It's basically. It's basically. Key, it's basically. Um, key fists from third edition. Yeah, and um, and all it does is imbue it to everybody within fifteen feet of you. Mm -hmm. Um, aura of smiting. Whenever an ally within your aura. 
scores a critical hit with a weapon attack, they deal additional radiant damage equal to half your herald level rounded down. That's weak as hell! That's weak as hell! Your smites are, are a multiple of d8s. You, you're, you're, you're telling me you're going to add at maximum level plus 10 damage on a critical! Oh! Oh! That's so scary. Really, if it's going to be called Art of or, or um Aura of Smiting, you should be. I I'd say you sh, I'd say a smarter thing to do would be to say, okay, anybody who's in your aura, you can you can give them your smites if you want to. Oh, I would. Well, no, I still think the idea of it being done on a critical hit is a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's just you change it. Aura of Smiting. Whenever an ally within uh. Within your aura, scores a critical hit with a weapon attack. Uh, at your choice, you may put a smite on top of that, mm -hmm. basically. Because at 10th level, you're going to have 3d8 smite. Yeah. And you're just going to be like, hey, yo, friend of mine who's over there in my aura, guess what? Boom! Holy attack on top of your sword or your axe or your hammer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it says... Wait a minute, hold on. Let me let me read that again. Let me read that again. Critical hit with Ho 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 okay. The ally has to be within your aura when they score a critical hit with a weapon attack. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be a melee weapon attack. It just says a weapon attack. If they're in your aura and they're using a bow and they score a critical at range with this, with the way this reads right now, that smite could be 100 yards away. Again, more, less, less, uh, they, they've forgotten to future proof again. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Where did competence go? <laughs> Um, Even Warlock, with all of its bullshit and lackluster presentation, had competent future proofing. I'm right. I ha at this at this point, I am declaring I am right. There are multiple authors on these documents that don't talk to each other because mm -hmm. this is a different writing style than the last document. Yeah, and a, definitely a different writing style than documents much much further past. Mm -hmm. So, this has so much copy pasta in it that I'm amazed someone didn't run it through a college plagiarism check. They automate those now, you know. <laughs> There's an AI that'll read your paper and make sure you didn't steal your shit. This needs to be run through one of those to see who you stole your shit from. Ah! Where's the competence? Yeah. Did they just fire the competent people? Either, either that, or either that, or there were way too many traditionalists on on the on the um, on the crowd who are, who are demanding that everything interesting get gimped because that's how Watsi does it. They'll bring out something interesting in UA and then get and then gimp it until its final release. <sighs> um. Although, as an aside, I think I think the whole I think the whole do release things and development as UA articles actually causes more problems than it's than it helps. The reason they do that is to is to is to gauge audience response and see which ones are worthwhile keeping in production and which ones just need to be dropped. Which which if they did if they had if they had a better audience then maybe that would work. Oh no, they have the audience they want. Slavishly devoted, blind to anything else, willing to spend endless amounts of cash on their product. They're GW in all but name. Don't get me started on <laughs> GW given, given, given events over this week. <laughs> Next week we hear similar events for Watsy. And then I just tell you, told you so. <laughs> I, will I, will take, I will take that on the chin if that, if that happens in seven days.
Uh, I don't know if it'll be it in one exact week, but the, the point is, things GW does, Watsy does as well. Mm -hmm. But we are not here to pulpit about Watsy or GW. Let's go on to the f exploration next, which I... Uh, I have no expectations, but I somehow... Re I somehow have the sneaky suspicion I will still end up disappointed. <laughs> There's, does it seem like there are less exploration necks in this one than in than in previous ones? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is about average for some of like the casters. Um, but definitely, and and we saw a lot more last week in Warlock because most of their exploration necks were just old warlock invocations turned into exploration acts, which don't get me st mm, that still makes me so fucking pissed yeah i can't i can't say i blame you on that kind of thing just ah uh, but i'm pretty sure while this is on the lower end it's still in the averages mm -hmm. it's not like i think there was one a while back that was only like five or six Any, anyways, so first we have bestowed understanding. When attempting to understand a, a language which, with which you are not proficient, you can make a DC insight check to, un, to understand the basic message. If the language is considered forgotten, you roll with disadvantage. You can do so a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier and regain spent uses upon finishing a long rest. Why, is that, why does this have a limited amount of charges? Not only why does this have a limited amount of charges, why does this have no narrative explanation for how you are being bestowed understanding? Is it? Are you attempting to imply that, oh, as a herald of my god, I must understand all things, and thus, uh, at least at the most basic fundamental level, to connect to everyone else? But you don't say that. You're just like, when you try to understand language, roll dice, and if you succeed, you get the gist. If it forgot language, roll dice with disadvantage. That's all this is. Mm -hmm. I. <sighs> you know, this feels infantilizing. You know, at the very, as as much as people say that there was no role, that there was no, a common thing that I hear about fourth edition is there was no ro there was there was no way to ro there was no way to role play or there was no or um. There, or there was no there was no flavor to to your effects or so, or some kind of stuff like that. Um. With feats, uh, gr uh, de um, depends on the feat. But when it came to the powers, there was always a bit of there was always a bit of flavor text with them. Okay, I, I just I, I first first monk. But I, I have a, I have a few things I just needed to get out of my head here. First, this just this first knack here feels infantilizing. This feels. Oh, you you're not smart enough for the social stuff. So here, this just does thing. This feels like patronizing, condescending bullshit. It's also a poor um, understanding of it's also a poor understanding of how language works. Yes, because that's, um, that's... well to to use an to use an example. Let's con consider um consider Zemeckis's take on a Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Which was try which was trying to be as book was trying to be as book appropriate as possible. And while I'm pretty sure that ma that made my old English lit professor happy, the problem is um, Victorian era English is not the same as modern day English. They may as well be two different languages. And Middle Era English is not Victorian Era English is not Modern English and Old English, which is what Beowulf was originally written in and what I read out loud to my professor when he tried to emasculate me by saying I couldn't read Old English, is not to Middle English, is not to Victorian English, is not to Modern English. Yes. Yeah. English is, ironically, a living language. <laughs> well, most, um, there was an interesting parallel that I remember a biologist making where he where he li he likened the evolution of species to the evolution of language, which on, yes. on some on some levels is is cer is certainly true. Mm -hmm. All those different versions you mentioned are technically still English, but a but um 
you but it but the um path only goes one way yeah um, we don't we don't go back to those languages we're here now there's a U, there's a youtube channel that i follow called ab alpha beta that specializes in exploring old languages and they've done a couple me they've done a couple of meme posts on the on the matter um chief among them being the, the being dubbing biggest dickus in latin um and a more recent one is the Lamar Rose Franklin meme, but dubbed it in old French. <laughs> <laughs> and I sh I shared th I shared that with Maddie, who who um as a French Canadian speaks French, and he had no idea what anyone was saying without the song. because it, because it's old French. Mm -hmm. It's French that not even modern French people in France would know. No. Um, Unless they're a scholar of some sort. Yeah, yeah, and e and even then, that now even I'm pretty sure most scholars will admit that that knowledge is incomplete. Yes. No, so, so something something I'd also like to point out here, with bestowed understanding, what it's saying is, if you try to read it or hear it, you get the general gist, mm -hmm. which is something that even people who are not bestowed divine understanding can do. Difficultly. What's I'm get? Are you getting at? Are you? Is the question you're getting at is what's paladin about this? Yes. How is this something only a paladin should have? This bestowed understanding thing could go to literally anyone. Anyone could have this because all you have to do is concentrate and make the effort. And you'll eventually understand the idea someone is getting across to you, even if you don't understand the words. A after all, let's uh, let's be perfectly frank and clear about this. Mm -hmm. Every culture that has ever met any other culture in the world that does not speak the same language had at at, at the very first meeting they had to take the time to point at pictures on vellum and say the word in their language, and then point at the person across from them, point at the picture, and hear the same fucking word in the other person's language. This is, this is not a new concept. This is so old. This is, this, is, this is what we call not even reinventing the wheel. This is rediscovering the wheel. The only... The only approach, the only mod that I can think of that would make this somewhat approachable, is if something like bestowed understanding was specific to, to um, non-earthy language. You know, so, you know, um, celestial, celestial, demonic, demonic, that kind of thing. Celestial, demonic, uh, any of the elemental languages, draconic. Mm -hmm. I would say draconic because it's not technically a terrestrial language, um, and I don't mean that just because dragons fly. Dragons are exceedingly wise, with, uh, at least in many cases. We don't talk about the whites. <clears throat> that was a double joke, and I didn't even mean it that way. <laughs> uh, we don't talk about the white dragons, because it's commonly known that their, their brain is so cold they don't think. There you go. Mm -hmm. I ruined the joke just so, uh, just so Monk doesn't... Uh, doesn't get too much flack, though he doesn't care about it, neither do I. Whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> this is... I can only imagine that if Ash were here, this would be, like... This wouldn't be red. This would be, like, the color of blood. Yeah. Like, a step of, a step lower than <laughs> red, whatever that would be. It's just... It, like, you took the red highlighter across it 17 times until the highlighter was out or something. Um, mm-hmm. This is just so. It's terrible. Let me let it's... me pro let me proposition this instead instead of instead of doing it as the basic message. It's it's more of to to un, to to understand it to um to to see to see if it to see if it is a non earthy if it's an earthy language or not. If it is, you can get the basic idea. I mean that's. I'm not saying that's, just, I'm not saying that's perfect, but I think that would be a little bit more paladin-y. 
it, yes, but that it being paladin is to me set dressing. The primary issue I have is this is something that is so basic. Why is it a knack? Mm -hmm. Especially since knacks are supposed to ref are supposed to reflect the more social aspects or more social or more exploration aspects of that of that particular um, archetype. Um, now, what I would like to see here, if it's bestowed understanding, it's being bestowed from whatever source of power the paladin has, and it is actual understanding, but it's only understanding within the context of the ideology or deity or whatever that the paladin follows. So it can only be done on religious texts that share similar ideologies maybe or religious speech that shares a similar ideology you change this so that a it reflects it's a religious thing b the re and then b the reason that the herald can hear and understand it and i want it to be full understanding secondly but the reason the herald can hear and understand it is because it resonates it's something close to their goal, their ideals, their God, that the, the understanding is shared because these people are comrades in arms of some sort. Mm -hmm. That would make sense as an exploration act because you're going to encounter both followers of, of, of ideologies and deities that are aligned close to you and followers that are not. We already have that from the whole witnesses that see you of an opposite party try to avoid you with the intimidation one from earlier. Yeah. That good bestowed understanding, that would actually reflect both the paladin set dressing and the fact that it's a religious thing. Hmm. That it's and, and because you're going from place to place, there's always going to be some sort of opportunity to stop by a church, a cathedral, some sort of place of worship, find some religious texts texts, and look at them for this. Now, maybe you go to this place and you don't understand a damn thing, and you and but you can even glean knowledge from that. I, I can't read this writing. These are your religious books, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't read this writing. Oh, no. All of a sudden, this herald now knows that they're in, a, they're in enemy territory. Because they can't read any of the writing, and they don't understand any of the words spoken by the by these ancient priests who are speaking in a long forgotten tongue. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, now the herald is like, "Okay," goes back to the party. Guys, we got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Guys, we got to go. Why? I can't understand them. And the party goes, "The fuck are you on about?" Unless they unless they've been you know paying attention to what he's been doing in other towns. It's like, guys, just just trust me. We need to get out of here. <laughs> and that that would be an exploration knack. And it wouldn't be something that you would have so many times to use to, you know... It's a passive thing. And, it's, and what information you're going to get from these texts is completely up to the narrator at that point to decide. You could just open a, a, a religious book written in a language you don't understand in, the, in a dwarven stronghold, but their god has very close... Uh, ideological ties or ideological ide uh, uh, ideological understandings as as your god, and you can read the dwarven in these books, and they're hymn books. They're the hymns of the dwarves. But at least you know, oh, cool! I can read these hymns. I can worship alongside the dwarves if I like to. Um, I don't know why anyone wouldn't. So uh, if you're not worshiping alongside the dwarves, fuck you. <clears throat> but it also again, you glean the information of these people are going to be easier to work with and aren't necessarily going to be hostile against me. Yeah. There's a lot you can glean from a from a passive ability that gives you all of this social and mechanical interaction even if the information the narrator decides to give you is oh this is just a book of the of the lore of their it's it's their genesis, it's their creation myth, but you can read it. Mm -hmm. Just that information alone tells the tells a good player something, and it's not even meta knowledge at that point. Yep. But that's 
that's what I'd like to see with bestowed understanding. <laughs> I didn't mean spend so much time completely recontextualizing and rebuilding one exploration knack. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's go on to... Divine Health. You are immune to disease and have advantage on saving throws made to resist the poison condition. It's a feat. Pass. Hello, shittier version of Capstone for Monks. Mm -hmm. Do without. Your divine connection and years of training allow you to survive without food or water for a number of days equal to your charisma modifier without suffering any adverse effects. Yellow. I mean, uh, it, it attempts to have a narrative tie, and it gives you a useful, if you're out in the wilderness exploring ability, so mm -hmm. yeah, yellow. Um, exemplary. You gain an expertise die on athletics or acrobatics check, checks made to climb, jump, run, and swim. When your party makes a group athletics or acrobatics check, you may apply the results of your role to yourself and one ally. You choose which ally to apply your result to after everyone has rolled, but must do so before the narrator just says whether you succeed or fail. Um, on another class I, somewhere. I, ha I have several questions. One, what's paladin about this? This really feels like it should belong to the ranger if you, the ranger or the fighter if you ask me well two we we had i remember reading an exploration knack in another i forget which one but it was in another one of the of the uh class feature it's that was basically this exact thing you could pass an expertise die and and your and your result over to another person if they failed and stuff mm-hmm well, actually, actually, you have to do this before you succeed or fail, which, bring, which yeah, brings me to a... Th the, that's the only difference. Yeah. That's literally the only difference. Which brings, this me, is... to a th brings me to a third question. Um, if this is supposed to be, if this is supposed to be part of a group, part of a group check, why it, why is it that it, why is it that it's o that it's only applied to yourself and one ally? Additionally, um, why are you giving us a shittier version of something you already gave us in a previous document? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Miraculous discovery. I... You gain an expertise die on investigation checks, and your passive investigation increases by three. Additionally, when making investigation checks, you can do so using charisma instead of your intellect. Hey, that's one of those, uh, those feet uh, knacks that we saw back in Cleric. Yeah. It's the same exact goddamn thing. Once again, once again with the copy pasta. Anyway, prophetic protection. Whenever you would trigger a trap, the narrator makes a, se a secret charisma perception check against the DC to spot. On a success, you do not spot the trap, but get a strong sense that moving any further would put you in danger. Trap sense. It's a gimped version of a rogue's trap sense. And it's not even up to you. It's 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 on the GM. Mm -hmm. So they see you're about to walk into a trap. They make a they make a, a roll. Why aren't based you on... making the Why aren't you making the roll? Exactly, that's what I'm saying. The narrator makes the roll. That's this isn't even up to you. This is I. What the fuck? I did say it was a gimped version of Trap Sense, and it is so in more ways than one. It is so gimped, it may as well be wearing a gimp suit. Nah, don't don't give that crowd any ideas about this. They they'll get they'll get off on it. Um. Anyway, sense import. Your divine sense extends to detect whenever you enter a place that is or once was of great holy or unholy significance, and you learn basic information as to about why or to whom it was important. Additionally, you have advantage on checks made to learn more information about the area while you are there. This feels like an actual exploration knack for a paladin! <laughs> Holy shit! So you can you actually have... rise to competence. You're now at the baseline! <gasps> you made it to baseline! Congratulations! Get up off your ass! Get off the ground, stand up, and go higher now. Baseline is nothing to be proud of. It's like, wow, you don't suck. What do you want, a fucking trophy? It's the most backhanded of compliments we can give.
No, the most backhanded the most backhanded compliment is either congratulation or your winner. No, because those at least have, you know, positive connotations. This is congratulations, you made it to baseline. This is this implies that it took a vast amount of effort to come from the negative to zero. So it's You're the, at zero. The, is it the at least you tired? Yes. <laughs> this oh. is this is this is. You can't even fail pro uh, properly. This is you failed at failing, and no, that's not a double negative. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Und <sighs> undaunted. While exploring a place which you have never been to before, you can use your reaction to gain advantage on ability checks and attack rolls. You can do so a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier and regain spent uses upon finishing a long rest. Right, and what we're right back below the baseline. Where the fuck's the paladin in this? I um, I feel I feel like there was one discussion that may have been had, but some but at some point stopped. Where the, where um, eighth where there needed to be a, there needed to be a, an agreed upon theme for what for what eight for what each class would be doing for ex for um exploration and build knacks based around that. That conversation clearly didn't happen because as we've established, there's clearly some lines of communication issues coming coming across in the writing. What co what comes across to me is that ever since we hit adept, unfortunately, because that's when we started getting the the formatting that is closer to being actually that within a book with all the italicized um, anecdotes and the inset art. Ever since we hit Adept, we've been seeing a continual loss in quality. I would argue that this is worse than the Warlock. The Warlock had dead levels that we spent time filling, sure. Mm-hmm. But at least everything that it did get was warlock related, and there were more attempts to make some so some uh, some social aspects, even if they didn't hit the mark. And we made those bigger, better social aspects in our own stuff. This feels worse. Yeah, every level has something. Most most levels have more than one thing. In fact, all levels have more than one thing, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But all of it is very bog standard. And the social things that you do get feel weak, unimportant, and in many places, not even Herald slash Paladin related. They don't feel like something a messenger for a god would have. They feel like something the town priest would have. And then, of course, the exploration knacks. One exploration knack out of eight that actually feels like something a paladin or herald would, would have and do. Just one. Mm -hmm. It'd be the one I take for the first knack I take at level three. That's a fucking cool knack. Especially since, you know, you know that this, this is a, this is holy or unholy. You know the basic information about why and whom it was important to. You know, mm -hmm. oh, this is you walked up on this mountain. These the hewn stone here is clearly done by by uh by the ha by hand and not by the by the elements. And you get the distinct feeling that maybe just maybe the cro the chromatic dragons worshipped Tiamat here. That maybe that five headed mother of monsters was once uh, the 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 object of this place's unsettling aura. That's a cool little tidbit that a DM can throw in with this knack when you go into some place on a mountaintop or in a dungeon and you get this distinct sense of this is place where X power was worshipped by Y people or Y person or 
or Y race for Z reason, and your paladin can feel that. That's fucking cool. This is the only knack I would paint in blue. And I'd only paint it blue because of how cool it is, because of what you can glean from it. But even though it's blue, in comparison to other knacks we've seen and to the project up until recently, mm -hmm. this is a baseline. This is not excessive. It is not an, an Excel. This is a baseline. This does not. This is not go. This is not for those of you out there who uh who are scrubs that only pay attention to uh to what's Vogue. This is not plus ultra. No, I feel I feel like I feel like I I feel like um if I was to... <sighs> once again it once again it is astonishing how the descent that we've gone in this process because the first few documents were ver were very promising. The first nine documents were promising. It's especially the warlord because that was where we got to see what. They what they had what they had potential plans for with a twenty level setup. Yes. Yes, but then I just what happened, Yen World? What happened? This is what I want to know. I want, I I want. Okay, Yen World. If you ever watch any of these, is Especially this one with the Herald. If you ever watch any of these, my question to you is this. And maybe you'll answer it. What happened between Warlord version 2, which was the ninth playtest document with updates to a few updates due to issues, and Adept? What happened? between these two documents that it took a month to go from one to the next and there was a sharp drop in quality especially considering that that uh, many of your playtest documents prior to this Origins to Fighter to Rogue to Druid were all in the span of like every other week. Inspiration and Destiny to Sorcerer was two weeks apart. Sorcerer to Ranger was two weeks apart. Ranger to Berserker was two weeks apart. And then a month went between Berserker and Warlord, which makes sense because it's 20 levels instead of 10, so a full month instead of two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then a month from Warlord to Adept. And then we're back to the to the we're almost to one a once a week at this point, twenty sixth of February, third of or fifth of March, thirteenth of March, twentieth of March. Yeah, we're almost at once a week now. Are you guys rushing? Is that what this is? Because I'm noting here, prior to Warlord, you took about two weeks per document. About two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Then a full month for Warlord, because Warlord was full 20 levels in a completely original class. Something that had not been seen in base 5e. And then you're going once a week, all the way up to Herald, which I'll now note was on April 1st, and this document really does feel like an April Fool's joke gone bad. <laughs> This is this is. Would you say that this is an out of season April Fool's joke? I would say that this is an unintentional April Fool's joke. And then from Harold, we have one week to the one week to the combat. Not even one week, six days to the combat maneuvers chapter. But then from combat maneuvers, we have almost three weeks. And from from journeys seventeen, it's another week to June eighth. Oh no! It's excuse me. It's a month. Excuse me. One another month to June eighth. Excuse me. That's what I meant to say. So, were the documents from Adept to Herald rushed, or Adept to Combat Maneuvers? I should say rushed. And if they were rushed, why haven't you guys gone back and fixed them? 
if they're rushed and the reason you had such a long development time between combat maneuvers and journeys was to address maybe a lot of feedback that came up with these play tests they were like what's with these new six documents they all fucking suck if that's the type of feedback you got why didn't you guys go back and fix it I can't. I can't help but wonder if a good chunk, if a good chunk of their feedback was was on that was on them making things um, too too far removed from what people expect from D from D and D. I.e., they got festooned with a bu with a bunch of traditionalists. I I do I do remember at least I do remember at least one person telling me that some people really weren't happy with the inclusion of the maneuver system. So that's why I have that suspicion. I don't know. Five um. five e, level up five e was very promising for the first nine documents. If the back nine documents, which one of them is the combat document, mm -hmm. are not, and that's indicative of the, of the trend going forward, I I don't want to play this. I legitimately do not want to play this. If this is the trend we are going. That be that uh, being said, that being said, um, for, fortunately for us, we're probably we're probably going we're probably going to be completely caught up with the documents um, in, by the end of August. Yeah, obviously we're not doing one next week because um, because um, the entire temple is uh, is t is taking the is taking the weekend off. Um, Wait. You and I don't 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 encompass the entire temple. <laughs> um, <laughs> where the where the bo the bo but I am the I am the boss of the te I am the boss of the temple. Not to be confused, this is true. Not to be confused with the boss of the gym. But who's get who's gonna set who's gonna set something like this up if they don't have the backdoor access to the, to the uh, YouTube page? Yep, that's true. <laughs> I guess I guess the monastery just goes off whenever the monk goes off. Everybody, it is <laughs> it is my temple. That's the that's the way these kind of things work. Yep. However, the bar will still be open. Don't worry. Yeah, the bar will still be open. There's still there's there's still st there's still stuff that's get that's gonna be ha that's gonna be happening. And of course, ev even when I'm on vacation, I'm still I'm still gonna be peeping in peeping in. Um, on our on the Discord server, just to make sure nobody's tried to burn the place down. I pity the fool who tries to burn the place down. I'm pretty sure the rest of our our good brothers and sisters would beat them to death. Uh, if that if that ends up happening, it's a case of hey 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 hey, save some for me. <laughs> and then they'll use your famous line against you, monk. Get in line. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it but when it comes to when it when it when it comes to the when it comes to the herald, um, I I am still I'm still of I'm still of the opinion that the the big reason why it's always the hybrid and half caster kind of classes that always end up getting the shaft is because of the fact that they don't have anything to to make up for that discrepancy because obviously a half caster is they're not going to be a, they're not going to be as good as fighting as a straight as a straight up martial character and they're not going to be as good as casting as a full on caster but what do they have to make up for that now the bard is an exception to this rule because what they make up for it is being a diplomancer rogues have have been what are one of the are one of the originals in it and have had their niche um, firmly planted since day one. As Paladin, a skill monkey, yeah. yeah. Paladins are tr are trying to are trying to be a are trying to be a fighter cleric um, hybrid. That's all. That's always been fairly obvious. Yeah. The big problem with that is you ha is that you have two you have two sides of it that have vastly wide nets. And the stuff that the paladin is supposed to have that's unique to it, the unique niche that it's supposed to have, isn't strong and isn't strong enough to make up for that discrepancy. Um, exactly. Now, with some with some cla with some classes, when some when <laughs> the paladin archetype is applied in, uh, in applied in other games that don't have the tradition problem, you don't see this issue. Um, 
Fantasy Craft had the had the first off it had the, it had a generalized priest and caster instead of a bunch of different um, subtypes, but the the paladin archetype. If you wanted to do the mounted thing, you'd probably be playing a lancer with with some with some multi-classing in, into into um into priest. Um but if you but if you wanted to do, if you wanted to do the tr the traditional Arthurian knight in shining armor at as the as the inspiration went, there was a there was an advanced class called Crusader. That is all, that is all that is all about doing a doing a more freeform spin on the questing knight who's who's searching for the for the grail or something like that. Um I I really do I really do th I really do think that much li much like how you had the relationship with with their with their patron when we discussed the warlock uh -huh. I am I'm of the opinion that the pa that the social path that the paladin should be going on is on a quest so you think we should make them in some in some way, shape, or form much like a knight errant of sorts, or at least they have some <clears throat> to quote a to quote a famous and insane man. He's very insane these days. You you essentially want the herald to be that guy who goes. We're on a mission from Ged. Yes. You want an Elwood Blues? Got it. <laughs> El Elwood, bl Elwood, bl the ho the whole thing, the whole thing is, the is they have they have been they have been given some sort of mission from div from div from some sort of divine intervention. Elwood Blues counts. Um, the Boondock Saints also count. <laughs> Wow, these are these are some off the wall paladins, man. <laughs> it's they they well they they believed that they were being called by God to deal with organized crime. Elwood Blues felt felt that he was being called by God to get the band back together to save the orphanage, no matter which both path El, you both take. Elwood, both Elwood and Jake did, yeah. yeah. Both Elwood and both Elwood and Jake felt that they were called by God in that regard. It may be different paths, but it's the same. It's the same kind of archetype. You yeah. Are you are called, but you are called by a higher power to do to do some sort to do some sort of de of deed. So, um, in that respect, you all of those those two sections of social powers that we saw would be changed to relate to the quest and how it affects their goals and and interactions within the quest. More spe more specifically. I I feel I feel like the I feel like if if we were to rejigger this, the so the social features that they get are a reflection of how they pursue that goal. Do they pursue it with zeal? Do they do they pursue it as a as an as an idea to strive for but not necessarily achieve, or do, or or do they or do they use it as a um as a more as a moral back as a moral backdrop? That's or or do they do it as a form of penitence? Because not not all holy crusaders crusade because of their zealousness. They crusade to uh, find forgiveness. They want forgiveness from God, and the only way for God to forgive them is if He goes out and kills a thousand men in His name. <laughs> You know things like that. We have we have the the penitent the the penitent crusader out there. Mm. So, and give, given given how, given how they given how um, flagellants that, are a thing are a thing in darkest dungeon and Warhammer fantasy. Um, yeah. Yep. There's cer there's certainly that there's certainly that to draw upon. Now I'm doubly sad. Isn't now I'm doubly sad. Ash isn't here because you know he would have taken both of our both of our. Uh, our little ideas here, and he would have tried to run with it with another two-hour. Let's rejigger these social things. <laughs> Pro probably, um, but the but the point is at the very but the other the other major the other major issue is 
when I look at when I look at the actual class features with it within this, um, what is it? What is actually leveled up with it? I mean, there's... many of the class features have been slightly changed, but they're still basically just like the vanilla the vanilla uh, fluff. It's not like in say the level up druid where yeah, um, hit the level up druid's shape changing ability was only slightly tweaked. But that slight tweak had a lot bigger implications. Yes. Whereas the slight tweaks here have no other implication beyond the tweak itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, <sighs> when it comes to the slight tweaks, we have the whole thing of in of interplay between between spell between spell slots and and maneuvers, um, and the and the fact that you're getting spell casting a level earlier than normal, but. Not a, but not a whole lot else, and the stu and for all intents and purposes, most of the defi most of the defining features act exactly as they did. So where's the ad where's the advanced with the with the herald? This doesn't feel this doesn't feel like an advanced version of the paladin. It feels it feels like a slightly edited version of a paladin. Additionally, um. Like, well, like we've been seeing uh, with the lowering quality since Adept, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a lot more cases of where it feels like between paragraphs we're getting a different writer, yeah. or between features. Like when when you when we looked at the oh, which feature was it? The one that just says double proficiency on your on your insight check. The uh, the shitty zone of truth. Yeah. The uh, um, detect heresy, I think it was called, uh, where where it doubled your in your your pa your your proficiency bonus and added it to your passive insight, mm -hmm. and we've been seeing expertise dice all throughout these documents up until that point. We hadn't seen just double your proficiency and add it. We'd seen here's an expertise die and all that fun stuff. It's like somebody didn't get the memo. It's like somebody stopped caring. It almost seems like somebody just stopped caring. Um, but when it com when it comes to the, let me see how many people are on the actual team. Okay, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-three, pe twenty-three people in one in one form or another. So mm -hmm. obviously, some of them are obviously some of them aren't going to be writing per se. Um. But in in my not so humble opinion, that is way too that is way too many people. Well, and the and the real thing is, it wouldn't be way too many people if they all talked and communicated and made sure things were applied uniformly. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to point out that uh, with twenty three people. They aren't either. They aren't getting the errors pointed out to them by anybody, which means they lack a QA entirely, which is stupid. Even with playtest documents, you need a QA prior to putting out the playtest document itself, just to make sure you haven't uh, overlooked anything like those simple competency checks you failed in a few passages here. Yeah, the, um, the lack of future proofing and such. And. I am not. I am not saying that you that you've got a bunch of scrubs on because uh, because a lot of a lot of the people who are writing this, um, I've I've spo I've spoke I've spoken to it I've spoken to at least two to at least two of them myself. Mm -hmm. But the bit. But um, even if I'll put I'll put it this way, if I had tw if I had twenty. Very, very well-regarded veteran veteran writers on on FF Legend, whether whether they be veterans when it comes to when it comes to the video games, veterans when it comes to tabletop, or even veterans when it comes to other FF tabletop projects. Ultimately, I would have too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, you'd have to coordinate things. Maybe what you would do is instead turn them into writing teams. You'd have one head writer that would give out the ideas and the people would would write to keep them all in conformity and then they'd come back to the head writer for review and then that'd come back to us. 
there would be delegation. You'd have to delegate, otherwise the cooks in the kitchen would all be interfering with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, a long t- I, I've, made, I've mentioned this a few times, but a long time ago, I ended up reading a, um, po- a postmortem that was written in Game Developer Monthly on Final Fantasy XIII. And okay. Um, no, I think um, I think I think um, no, I think Nojima and Toriyama were the ones were the ones writing, and someone else obviously was translating. But what? But there were a few things in that 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 um, that really ended up putting some perspective on the on the development. One is that up until that point, they had they had they had they had divided their development team into these series of fiefdoms, each with they each with a each represented by one person who would who would interplay between the different mini fiefdoms. So one one set one room for the coders, one room for the artists, one and so on. Um the problem that they had is is early on um the the um f- the amount of the amount of people in those individual fiefdoms got way too big for that system to be efficient. Is a lot of people, I I think a lot of people don't quite grasp how much of a how much of a massive shift um, development was for a lot of studios jumping from SD to HD. Yeah, like a lot of things, a lot of things had to change a lot of fast, and not everybody was able to keep up. Yeah, and it it almost feels to me like something happened to change the. Uh, agility of this team whether it whether it was it now um i i'd imagine i'd imagine that the that the coof happening probably p- could have potentially put a damper on communication but i can't even go with that because Z- because zoom exists <laughs> well Stupid. and not not to mention like i pointed out um the documents were coming out fairly regularly mm-hmm. Um, every two weeks, and then we hit the, you know, because the Warlord was so much longer, it took a month, And but then once we return from the Warlord, they start coming out faster, mm-hmm. at one week each. And... I do ha- I do have to wonder if, um, because for the longest time, um, it was only known that, it, that the, that the um, Kickstarter was going to launch sometime in 2021. They never gave an outright date, but now they're saying that they're a few weeks away and a few, and so and so on. And it, I could definitely see the rush in that regard. Um, but if that if that's the case, no one's no one's saying that you need to have a that you need to have a complete book out when your ki- when the Kickstarter launches. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. Exactly. On to, on top of that, um. Really, I don't. I don't see the rush even between playtest modules or documents. Excuse me; these are not full playtest modules with like pregens and such. Yeah. Um. Right now, as as far as these playtest documents go, even they're all being released standalone, and none of them can actually have you play the game yet because of the fact that they don't have all of the elements together to play the game in a single document. Even other playtest documents, such as what we reviewed on Tuesday, has the bare bare basics that you need within the system to run the system, which allows you to actually play and test. Mm -hmm. This does not. This... uh, Right now, up until we get to the 18th play document, we're missing the combat section and the combat maneuver section. We've got the origin section, we've got the classes, and we've got the inspiration and destiny. But we also don't have the spells at all. No spell list or even the spell rules have been released and provided. We can infer certain things from some of the people that we've read. Mm-hmm. including the potential inclusion of our hated enemy, the concentration rule. Yeah. But we can only 
infer so much about the shape of the Venus de Milo's arms without the actual arms being on that statue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As it were. I'm... Here is my hope. My hope is that our review of the combat maneuvers uh, document, which will happen on the 30th, correct, Monk? Yes, Unle yeah. unless unless some massive monkey wrench gets thrown in gets thrown into it, we will be doing that on the 30th. I'm hoping we go into that. We see the quality that we already saw with some of the combat maneuver stuff in the other classes, and that the combat maneuver system is well done. That is my next hope. But I'm going to go in with no expectations anymore at this point. Mm -hmm. Adept, th Adept through Herald has left a very sour taste in my mouth. And it's going to take a lot for Ian World to cleanse my palate, so, as it were. So, um, final impressions, Monk? This need this ironically enough this particular document needed a level up because oh because right now it ju right now it just feels like paladin point one yeah last week for my for my particular final thoughts last week warlock was just missing things outright and you moved Warlock invocations into Exploration Acts and called them Exploration Acts. Which just... F there were some changes that were interesting. If I had to call it anything, it'd be, it'd be Warlock point five, mm -hmm. with missing bits. This, while it has less missing bits, is ironically worse because of the fact that, like Monk put it, it's Paladin point one. You've taken the Paladin... You've given it a new name, some flexibility with how it's supposed to follow its oath, and also left in most everything almost exactly as it was. There are slight tiny changes here and there that don't imply anything larger. They are just tiny changes for the sake of tiny changes. Mm -hmm. And out of all of the exploration necks you had, only one felt uniquely authentic to Paladin. The rest either felt like shitty feats or an exploration knack that should just be universal because anybody could do it and there's no way to tie it to the identity of the paladin mm -hmm. i don't know if the solution would be as monk said to much like how ash and myself proposed in warlock that you tie close to the patron and give social aspects based on your interactions and and aspirations dealing with the patron Maybe giving the Herald a quest in relation to their ideology or deity and making those social those social skills tie into how they are trying to fulfill that quest. So ultimately, I don't know how Ian Publishing and Ian World are going to fix the Herald. But right now, it's not that it's broken, it's just that it's not even really that changed and is whatever was broken in 5e is here mm -hmm. and i don't know monk <clears throat> that, that's why uh, that that is it is for that reason that when when we finish with when we finish with level up that won't be the end of this particular version of valley of the judge because you know that i love contrast and yep I have something in mind that I think would provide a nice control for the experiment. Ooh, nice. But that is that is going to be a matter for another day. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>